May I commence tonight's proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathering here this evening, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people. They have occupied and cared for our land for over 60,000 years, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and I acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded. I'd also like to acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the audience today. Uh, welcome and benvenuti to the iconic Shine Dome. My name is Anna Maria Rabia. I have the great privilege of being the Chief Executive here at the Australian Academy of Science and a very happy National Science Week to you all. A very warm welcome to our special guest, wow. Megan Christian, who is a member of the European Space Agency Astronaut Reserve. We are absolutely thrilled that you can be with us this evening. I don't know if this place feels or looks a little bit like a spaceship, but <laughs> um, it's also my great pleasure uh, to welcome all of our distinguished guests here this evening, including His, Excel His Excellency Mr. Paolo Crudele, the Ambassador of Italy to Australia. It is always wonderful to see you and to have you at our place. And Dr. Marco Lazzarini, the Scientific Attaché at the Italian Embassy. And of course, to all of our distinguished guests, fellows of the Australian Academy of Science, members of the diplomatic community, um, and representatives from government, academia, um, and the science sector more broadly. A very, very warm welcome to the Shine Dome to this very wonderful lecture this evening. I know this event has been much anticipated, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing about um, Megan's journey and looking at the numbers here tonight. Thank you all for coming out in such great numbers. Uh, so Megan grew up in Australia and studied here, and a little bit like the Matildas, she's an Aussie, just training abroad. Um, uh, but tonight we're going to claim you as one of ours, even though you share citizenship with the US, Italy and New Zealand. And looking at all of your national allegiances, it seems there's only really one team left for you to back, if you don't count England. So we know who you'll be backing tomorrow night. Um, may I ex extend my very special thanks to the University of New South Wales, the Centre for Ideas, the Powerhouse Museum and the Italian Embassy, without which we wouldn't be here this evening. So before we hear from Megan, uh, please join me in welcoming to the podium His Excellency Mr. Paolo Crudele, the Ambassador of Italy, to say a few words. Thank you. Good evening. And thank you very much to the Chief Executive of the Academy of Science, Anna Maria Arabia. It's an honor to be here with you. Uh, to share this opening uh, dedicated to the astronaut, Megan Christian. My congratulations, really, for, for the recent selection by the European uh, Space Agency. Dr. Christian has a unique, extraordinary career. Just to mention a few passages which I would love to understand, but I can't. After completing her PhD in industrial chemistry at the University of South Wales in Sydney, she successfully worked on the development of innovative nanomaterials. She took part in two parabolic flights campaigns experiencing weightlessness. She took part in two Antarctic scientific expeditions, including one during the winter night on the Antarctic Plateau. And she applied to become an astronaut and was successfully selected. What makes me and what makes us particularly proud is that Megan has chosen to base her professional career in Italy. This evening's event is also intended to highlight this special relationship between Italy and Australia. The cooperation between the two space agencies is solid, as evidenced by the Memorandum of Understanding signed in Adelaide in 2020. This morning, we were at the Stromlo Observatory, and I want to thank the director, Trifoni, for hosting us. Uh, and we were there for the inauguration of the Italian-Australian joint venture in building a satellite together. And that will be launched by the end of November. It's a great outcome. Several brilliant Italian companies in the space business operate here in Australia, and the presence at the embassy of our scientific attaché, Marco Lazzarino, is also significant to further develop this bilateral relationship. Let me take this opportunity to thank Professor Lazzarino for his work and the numerous activities he has undertaken since arriving in Canberra. It's also important to note that the European Union 
programs are part of Dr. Christian activity in Europe. She was recruited in Bologna within the framework of the European Union Horizon 2020. The same collaboration involving the university in Brussels, the Italian leading company in aerospace, Leonardo, the Italian National Center for Research and the University of Cambridge gave Dr. Christian access to the first parabolic flight. Last but not least, late, late, last year, Megan Christian applied and obtained the Italian citizenship, something that makes all of us very proud. Even though I understand that Megan is now a citizen of four different countries, as it's been mentioned, which is quite a record, I have to say, I'm happy to know you're also Italian. My congratulations for that. It is clear that for your personality, the earth is definitely becoming a bit small. So only space can offer you new horizons to explore. I wish you all the best, Dr. Christian, for this new adventure, and thank you for honoring us tonight with your presence and with your participation. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> good evening, everybody. I would like uh, to extend my acknowledgement to Anna Maria Rabia, for, to the Academy of Science, to host us in this uh, beautiful evening, and to His Excellency Ambassador Paolo Crudere for the very nice words she already spent, he already spent on, on this event and uh, on the exceptional career of uh, Megan Christian. I'm here, and I would like just to spend a few minutes to explain why we are very proud of the decision of uh, Megan to uh, build up her career in Italy and explain that uh, and show you a few figures uh, of uh, the Italian research and Italian science because very often we, we imagine Italy as a beautiful land for uh, architecture, for historical heritage, for food, for nice uh, uh, beaches and mountains, but actually in Italy there is also a very strong uh, commitment to science and to research. So I would like just to show you a couple of example of what we are able to do in Italy. So, so <laughs> Italy school also for science. This is the, the message I would like to, to pass to you very, very shortly in these next uh, five minutes. So first of all, Italy has been in science in the history, in the centuries and in millennia behind us. So we can start with the, the fact that the first, the first university and the oldest university in continuous operation in the world is in Italy. And it's actually the University of Bologna that in 50 years will celebrate our first thousand years of activity. And it's not a coincidence, or maybe it is a coincidence, I don't know, that Megan was working for 12 years in Bologna. But <clears throat> at the beginning, the University of Bologna was more dedicated to law studies, to humanistic studies. Actually, at that time, there was no distinct, distinction between science and philosophy and, and knowledge in general. The distinction between science and philosophy came from one of the most famous scientists, but also one of the most famous philosophers of Italy, which is Galileo Galilei, which has been credited to discover the satellites of Jupiter, invent the the telescope, but also to introduce the scientific method, which makes the difference between science and philosophy. The scientific method is that method that allows you to develop a theory by describing and creating a theory and then to verify the theory and then falsify the theory. So see if the theory really applies to all the observation you do. So this is something that we really owe to the Galileo Galilei and to the philosophy that was developed at that time in Italy. And then we, along the centuries, we, we went on and we had other very famous scientists. There's a picture, a painter of Alessandro Volta, who is the father of the electric battery, which is very important nowadays. You can think that we are moving all our energy to electricity and we need something to store electricity and these are batteries that was invented by Alessandro Volta. In this picture, Alessandro Volta is explaining the battery to Napoleon, Napoleone Bonaparte. So that was a very, very important uh, development in science. And another very important development in science which is, has been, uh, let's say, uh, that we, 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 we can uh, recognize to Italian scientists is the development of nuclear energy. 
I know that sometimes nuclear energy is not, it's quite controversial, nobody likes it, but it's something that, uh, in a sense, can uh, uh, show how good we are in manipulating matter. We can control matter and we can really reproduce something which is happening in the stars. So, going back to the stars and to our astronaut. But this is not only history, Italy is also the present, and these are some infrastructure that we have in Italy. We are run at the European and world level. So the first one on <coughs> your left is the uh, synchrotron, which is in Trieste. There is also a synchrotron in Melbourne. But in this one, there is also the operation of the um, free electron laser. There are only 10 free electron lasers operating in the world, and this is the only one which is coherently seeded, so the first still seeded. And this is something unique in the world and that all the world admire us. The second one <coughs> is the, an interferometer, which is actually the only, there are only three interferometers able to detect the gravitational waves, which are some strange contraction or ripples in the, in the space-time texture that envelop the whole universe. It's something that comes from the relativity, and uh, they are being observed only in two interferometers in the United States and this one in Italy. So this is a very, very precise and technologically advanced uh, uh, instrument. The third one <coughs> is a tokamak, so it's a reactor that is aimed at developing the nuclear fusion, so the energy of the future, not in the next 10 years, probably not in the next 50, but in 100 years we will rely on this kind of energy. And it's a project which is entirely based in Italy and is uh, included in the ITER development process. And the fourth one <coughs> is the fourth fastest supercomputer in the world. So this is not the first one. The first one is in the United States, but we are still competing in also in this kind of field. So this is just to give you an overview that the fact that we are technically at the, at the, on, on the edge of the, of the science. And also Italy is very uh, keen in collaboration, in international collaboration. So we are open to collaboration with all the countries, all the world. We are hosting two international institutions in Italy. <clears throat> we are the Austin country for the ICGB, International Center for Genetic and, Bio and uh, Bioengineering, and for the ICTP, International Center for Theoretical Physics. They are both uh, institutions which are addressing the developing countries and try to teach and to grow the, the scientific um, competences in the developing countries. And we are funding uh, with, among the funding countries of many other international um, institutions like the, the CERN in Geneva, like the European Space Agency that <laughs> gave, will give the uh, Megane the opportunity to go into space, the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, the European uh, Synchrotron Research Facility, the SCAO, which is the Square Kilometer Array Observatory, which is running the SKA in the Western Australia, has been funded. Italy was one of the funding countries of this uh, uh, enterprise and the European Gravitational Observatory, which is the one that was running the Virgo uh, experiment. And we are partner country, many other, I just mentioned the European Southern Observatory, but there are many others. And about the European Gravitational Observatory, I just invite you to our next, sorry, I, I use a little bit of advertisement in this stage. The next event we are organizing within the Science Week, that will be next Wednesday, and we'll talk about gravitational waves and the new project, which is Einstein Telescope. This will be at ANU, just here, and it's still open, so if you are interested, just please register them. <clears throat> so, these are Italy numbers. We have roughly 100 universities. Uh, we have uh, 2 million students, 50,000 50 prof 50, professors, many universities, many research centers. I would like just to point your attention to one very peculiar place, which is Trieste, which is actually the city where I come from, which has been named the, the city of knowledge or the city of science because it's the city in the world with the largest concentration of scientists and researchers. We have roughly 35 scientists every 1,000 inhabitants. It is 10, high, 10 times higher than the concentration of scientists in the more developed country. So this is basically a very, very short uh, overview of the science and the science opportunity that you have in Italy. And Italy is able to provide you the, the, the chance and the possibility to do good science. 
but to do good science, we also need good scientists. So let me skip this to one. So Italy is not only this, okay? It's also doing good science. I have an opportunity to do nanoelectronics. You recognize the person that has pictures? <clears throat> or uh, oh, do exploration in Antarctica? And again, the same person. <laughs> or making, oh, come on, parabolic flights. And again, the same person. So with those pictures, it's really my pleasure to invite on the stage Megas, Megan Christian with a big applause for her. I don't know about you, but I just learned a new word, Peter Flop. I, I, didn't, I didn't know about that one, even though I was in Bologna, where Leonardo is. Um, grazie all'avanciatore e all'addetto scientifico per l'invito, and thank you to the Australian Academy of Sciences for, for hosting this event in, in the Shine Dome. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to talk to you, and this is my first big event on the, this kind of whirlwind tour that I'm doing in, the, in Australia, which is just, you know, Canberra and Sydney at the moment. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be able to talk to you. So, I'm going to talk to you about basically my career, let's say, <laughs> which hasn't been what you would call a traditional one. It's gone off on some tangents along the way. So, I'm going to introduce you to some of the things that I've done. Go ahead. There we go. Uh, so I was born in the UK. Um, uh, yeah, you can see my age now. Um, <laughs> I, but I only lived there until I was five years old. Uh, so when I was five, my family moved to Australia. I also have New Zealand citizenship because my parents are New Zealanders. Um, so I went to the University of New South Wales. I did a Bachelor of Engineering in Industrial Chemistry and then a PhD. Uh, my PhD was on, on nanomaterials for hydrogen storage. And after that, I was looking for a postdoc, and I thought that I would like to get some international experience. Um, and so I was looking for something in Europe, because at the time, my passport was good for Europe, my UK passport. Uh, so I found a, a postdoc in, in Bologna, hosted by the, the Graphene flagship at the National Research Council of Italy. And so I moved there in 2014, and it was for what was supposed to be a sort of one to two year postdoc. I actually ended up staying for nine years, um, and hopefully I will explain to you a little bit why. Um, and then just recently I've, I've moved back to the UK after this um, selection as a, as a member of the res astronaut reserve. So um, just a little bit of background on the postdoc that I was doing in, in, uh, in Bologna. So it was for the production and characterization of nanostructured composite materials based on graphene, which um, might sound very technical, but it's actually a really, really broad topic um, using this quite innovative new material at the time. Um, and my particular focus was on alternative energies, using it for batteries. But one of the things that I noticed moving to Italy, moving to somewhere in sort of the center of Europe, is the difference between doing research there and doing research here. So there is a huge amount of really, really high quality research happening in Australia. The problem is that when you do collaborations, when you go to conferences, you have to travel a really long time to get there. So unfortunately, it's a little bit difficult to, uh, to pursue these. I mean, it, it, we do it anyway, and there are some amazing collaborations going on, and with the increase of um, connection in the world, it's becoming easier. But uh, these maps just show you, the first one is, is the conferences that I went to during the three years of my PhD. I actually had an opportunity to go to quite a few. Um, but then we go across to my, the first year of my postdoc and just being able to travel across to all these different conferences and collaborations. It, just, it made life a lot easier. So that was one of the reasons to, to go to Europe. This is Bologna. <laughs> just to convince you that it's a lovely place. Um, so that's my, my husband in the top left there with our little dog, Matilda, uh, with a view over Bologna. Uh, in the middle, that's our, that's our penguin. She's called Penguru. She travels everywhere with us. You'll see her later in, uh, in some videos. Uh, that's us on a, on a tour, uh, seeing some Parmigiano Reggiano. 
Um, you can see some views of Bologna and also Tortellini, which are uh, just some of the excellent foods that you can find in Bologna. So um, these photos might be familiar. Uh, this is just an idea of, of some of the projects I was working on. So um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about graphene, uh, but it's a, it's a 2D material that's really interesting for a lot of electronics applications, for example. What was I doing? I was making 3D graphene, which sounds a little bit silly, um, but trust me, it's, it's interesting for things like energy storage um, and also for some space applications. And so this gave me the opportunity, oh, I put this slide out of order. This is, uh, <laughs> this is going back to Bologna again. Um, so uh, I guess having had the opportunity to, to do some really interesting research, uh, my husband and I finally decided to um, buy a place, buy an apartment in Bologna. Um, and that was interesting. Um, just not just the, the, the process of buying a place in a country which is, you know, um, you, you haven't been there for that long, so your language squil skills are not up to the kind of legal level. Um, and then uh, also renovating it completely. Um, but that was another adventure and uh, just shows how much that we enjoyed living there in Bologna. So as I said, one of the um, exciting pieces of research I got to do was um, on uh, some space applications of graphene. So without going into too much detail, it's basically using graphene in coatings for some devices that cool down electronic components of satellites. Uh, and so these have to work in satellites, so they have to work in microgravity conditions. And so we had to test them on a parabolic flight, uh, which is how you can get weightlessness here on Earth. Uh, so you can see in the video there that the maneuver that this airplane is doing to get um, 20 seconds at a time of, of weightlessness, um, you can see now that it's at the, the, the top of the parabola, it, there is a, there's 20 seconds of weightlessness. And then as it, as it goes up and as it goes down, you get kind of double gravity during those periods. Um, so that was a video that I took out the window and a video at the same time of what's happening in the plane. There we go, back down to 2G, and you can see that the, the penguin is swing, swinging wildly. So that's Pengaroo again, and I'm hoping that if and when I go to space, she will get to be my zero-G gravity indicator there as well. So why did I change from doing this material science research to then going off and doing this crazy adventure in Antarctica? Well, I've always been a fairly curious sort of person. So um, when I was probably about 10 or 12 years old, I went to the International Antarctic Centre in New Zealand, uh, in Christchurch, and I was absolutely fascinated by it. Um, it was, yeah, just really, really interesting. And I thought, okay, one day I'd like to go to Antarctica. I thought that it would probably be on a cruise or something like that. Um, but watch this space. I also enjoy a challenge. Um, and I guess that's why I did a PhD and I worked, on, worked in research, because it's definitely challenging. It's definitely challenging to come up with new ideas for new materials and work out you know, what, answer, what question you want to answer and how to get to that answer. So I guess that's a lot of the reason why I decided to do science and engineering and research in particular. And I also love adventure. Um, my family's thing is uh, doing whitewater rafting together. Uh, so I've done a lot of that over the years and I just like the outdoors basically. Um, one of my favorite pastimes is doing via ferratas, which are kind, a kind of protected climbing route in the Alps in Europe. Um, you, you're wearing a, a harness with two carabiners and you sort of clip yourself along on the side of a, a cliff face. Um, where there's a, there's a wire along the way. And, and I sort of think of that as the closest thing we have on Earth to a spacewalk, because basically they're wearing two carabiners as well, and they're hooking themselves along the side of the space station. So, uh, you know, that's the world's highest via ferrata. So because of this love of, well, this curiosity, this love of challenging myself and this love of adventure, I decided to go to a place which has a lot of records to its name, which is Antarctica. It's the most isolated, the coldest, the most arid. Antarctica is actually a desert. 
So uh, there's a lot of water there, but it's all ice. It has the highest average si height above sea level, which might be surprising. Um, I didn't know before, before I learned more about it that actually there are mountains and volcanoes in Antarctica. And uh, the average height is something like about 2,000 meters um, because there's a very, very large plateau. And in fact, the station where I went is on that plateau. It has the highest wind speed, fortunately not where I went, but on the coast it has extremely high wind speeds. And at the same time as being a desert, it has the largest freshwater reserve on the planet. Depending on you, how you count it, it's something like 70% of the world's fresh water. So this is the logo of my, uh, my team, the DC-15, which is the 15th uh, winter rover crew at, at, at Concordia, which was in 2019. First of all, we had to go through training. Um, and we did training together with the scientist who went to Mario Zucchelli Station, which is on the coast. So we also had to learn how to jump out of boats into really cold water and be rescued from them, which is why I'm looking very orange there in that suit, which wasn't exactly um, working as well as it should be. It was definitely letting water in. In Antarctica, they don't do that, thankfully. We had to do a lot of uh, firefighting training because one, fire is one of the biggest risks there at Concordia Station, because it's, it's actually on three kilometers, more than three kilometers of ice, and so there's no way of actually getting to the ground, um, so grounding any el electric equipment. Uh, so that means that a lot of st static electricity builds up, and this static can then, uh, you know, you can, you can get a spark, and that'll cause a fire. So we had to be very, very careful, and we also had to learn how to be firefighters. We also had some training on sort of adapting ourselves to the conditions. So we spent a week um, camping on the glacier of Mont Blanc. Um, we only got down to minus 10 degrees there, so it wasn't really much conditioning. But, you know, we got a, a taste of extreme conditions. And then finally, just with the winter over crew, which is this, this group of 13 people here, uh, we had another, oh, another week together doing some sort of team building activities because we were going to be stuck together for nine months of that year that we were there, completely isolated, so we had to get along well. There we go. So how do you get to Antarctica? Well, it depends where you're going. But since I was going to Concordia Station, which is here in the middle, um, first of all, we got to New Zealand, and then we took a military aeroplane from Christchurch down to Mario Zucchelli Station on the coast. Um, and it, I can tell you it wasn't a particularly comfortable aeroplane. Uh, and that's about a six or seven hour flight. And so Mario Zucchelli is here on the coast. And from there, we took a smaller plane, this DC-3 Buzzler, to Concordia Station, which is another four hours around about. This is me at the passenger terminal in Christchurch. We had to already put on our suits um, just in case there, is, there was any sort of difficult landing or, and basically just because when you're on the plane, there is really no way of getting changed because you're packed up like sardines, as you can see here. And this was my first view of the sea ice. On the C-130 airplane, there's just this tiny little window that we all sort of took turns looking through, uh, and I managed to snap this photo out the window. Actually, the second time I went to Antarctica, I got to go on a more normal airplane. It was just a normal Airbus, um, and so I had my own window, and I could watch out the window, and that was just spectacular. But this was my very first view of the sea ice in Antarctica. Then this was my arrival at Mario Zucchelli Station, uh, which it might be surprising. You might think that it should be just snow and ice everywhere, but actually Antarctica is a continent, so underneath all that snow there is land. And during the summer months, that, that land is exposed. You don't necessarily uh, see it covered in snow and ice. Whereas at Concordia, um, which is at an altitude of 3,233 metres, it's definitely all ice, and this was the, the view from my, from my window. So why did they choose that location? Well, first of all, it's a, uh, it has this really thick ice shelf, which makes it interesting for uh, glaciology experiments, and I'll go, in, go into more detail on one of those in a moment. 
The high altitude and the atmospheric conditions mean that it's an excellent place to do astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, it's inside the polar vortex, which means you can do observations of the ozone layer. It's a long way from any other Antarctic bases. So the closest Antarctic base is Vostok, uh, which is about 600, 700 kilometers away. So the nearest people to us are, are that far away. Um, and it's also far from the coast, so you don't get any perturbations from the sea. So that means that it's really good for any kind of Earth science observations. And then there's the last one, which I'll go into a bit more detail later. But the isolated conditions and the fact that it's such a hostile environment mean that it's really interesting for the study of human behavior, um, quite similar to a space mission. So uh, Concordia is also known as White Mars. But the very first experiment at Concordia, at Dome C, as it was originally called, Dome Charlie, uh, was this EPICA, European Project for Ice Coring in Antarctica. So what they did was they drilled this ice core, which was over three kilometers long, um, and they cut it up into small slices. And as you can see in these slices, there are lots of bubbles inside. Now, they could correlate the depth of that slice with the, the year in history. So in this way, they could work out what the atmospheric composition was back over the last 800,000 years. And so we get this famous graphic of the, uh, this, the carbon dioxide and the methane in the atmosphere going back 800,000 years. And we can see that in the last 100 years, it is well higher than anything else we, could, we have seen in history. There's another project going on at the moment, and the second time I went to Antarctica, I got to go and visit it, uh, called Beyond Epica. And this time, they're trying to go back a million and a half one and a half million years, um, because during that period there was quite a large change in the, the natural uh, climate. And uh, so we will most likely uh, see again that even when there's a huge change in, in the, the natural climate, uh, it's still nothing like the levels that we have today. So this was the first camp at, at Dome C, at Dome Charlie. This tent in the middle is where they were doing the ice cores. And then around it, there are various sort of warehouses. And these are the tents where they slept at that time. Then in, uh, in 1993, they decided to build a base there. And Concordia is actually a um, Franco-Italian base. So it's actually the only international year-round station in Antarctica. And this is some photos of its construction. It could only be done during the summer season. And the summer season is quite short. It goes from sort of November to January. Um, so it took a while. But in 2005, um, it was opened for its first winter. How did they get in there with all these big parts? They obviously couldn't fly it all in by airplane. So they came in by what's called the raid or the traverse, uh, which is a long string of, of tractors. They come in from the coast. It takes something like 11 to 16 days to arrive. Uh, and they bring in all this large material. And it's still today. So every summer, this traverse basically goes back and forward three, two to three times during the summer. And they bring the fuel. And they bring. Uh, food and they bring large scientific instruments and then they take away the waste because the Antarctic Treaty says that we can't leave anything in Antarctica. So they bring in the fuel and then they take away the waste. It's a very, very slow journey. It's about 1,600 kilometers, but it takes them up to 16 days. This is a drone video of, of the completed base. It's from the year that I was there for the winter. Um, so you can see the sciences that are done there now. Um, but just to kind of outline what's, what's going on here. So on the left-hand side, we have the, the uh, quiet tower, which is where the, all the bedrooms are. So the base itself can hold about 35 people. Um, during the summer season, we get up to something like 90. So we use that original camp again, those tents that you saw, plus an extra uh, summer camp that, we, that, that was built. Um, we also have our offices, and we have a small hospital on the bottom level. Whereas on the, in the loud tower, that's near the, the diesel generators, which are over here, um, that's where we have the, the kitchen and the eating area. Uh, we have a gym, 
and we have the mechanical workshops. All around, you can see these containers. They, they have um, supplies for the year, uh, including food. So one of these containers, well, actually most of these containers at the front here contain, sh contain food, and our weekly shopping trip would be to one of these containers at the front. Uh, and then behind the base here, you can see the laboratories. So they're sort of anywhere from 500 metres away to about a kilometre away. Um, and we had to go out there and work in the laboratories every day. That includes during the, the winter. Uh, but these laboratories are for things like uh, physics, chemistry, uh, geomagnetism. Uh, and over here we have a tower with some, some meteorological instruments on it. And that's about a kilometre from the base. So just to give you an idea of the conditions, um, and you can see this little video of, of what the sun does during the summer. So there are about 100 days of 24-hour sun, and then we have a changeover period, and then there are 100, about 100 days of complete darkness, and then again, a changeover period. So that kind of does crazy things to, to your sleep patterns and to your body and you know how you're feeling, basically. Um, and then there, there are the temperature conditions. So this was, uh, as you can see down here at the bottom, the lowest temperature that we got to during the year was a wind chill of minus 104 degrees Celsius. And yes, I worked outside. I worked outside every day. <laughs> so I have felt that temperature, but I won't say that I've felt it on my skin because I probably wouldn't be here had I felt it on my skin. I would just be one giant uh, blister. Um, because any little bit of skin that you have exposed at those temperatures just gets completely burnt. And that goes, that's the same goes for, for breathing. So you have to cover your mouth because if you try to breathe when the air is that cold, you just can't do it. You basically freeze your lungs. Uh, so without wind chill, um, we got down to about minus 80 degrees Celsius. Um, the other thing to note here, another couple of things, the humidity is extremely low. As I said, it's a desert. So chapped lips, bloody noses, that was just the norm. Uh, along with that, there was the low atmospheric pressure. So at sea level, we're used to an atmospheric pressure of about 1,000 hectopascals. There, this was a good day. We were on 640, but it went down as low as sort of 610 on a bad day. And so that means that we're getting about 60% of the oxygen that we're used to getting, which means that as you saw, the base is on three levels and there's no elevator in there. So going up and down those stairs was tiring. Safety is obviously very important. Um, as I mentioned, fire can happen. And so we have to have a way of escaping from the base. And that's uh, this little video here is of when I was doing an exercise in an ex escape sock. Unfortunately, these don't work during winter, so during winter you kind of have to just work out how you can get out without hitting the fire. Oh, I'm going again. <laughs> there we go. Just a, a bit of a rundown of some of my projects. So the first project was called the Baseline Surface Radiation Network. Um, so these are some radiometers which are basically studying the energy balances. So the, ra the solar radiation that comes in and the solar radiation that's reflected. And that gives us a kind of baseline for the rest of the world uh, because we don't have any impact from humans here. And it uh, goes into climactic models and it's also useful for calibrating the same data that's taken from above by satellites. But what did I do? Well. Mainly, I walked around with a paintbrush and a hairdryer and removed ice and snow from on the instruments. <laughs> and one of those instruments was on that tower that I pointed out to you earlier. So every week I had to, with a colleague of mine, had to climb this tower. It's 45 meters high, uh, so we were, you know, harnessed in. Um, remember the low oxygen levels, so this was hard work. It's about a kilometre away, so you have to walk a kilometre, you have to dig up the snow to get underneath where, the, uh, where your harness is, is held, uh, then you have to climb the tower, come back down again, and then head back. But it was actually also the best part of the week, because more, normally you can't really stay outside. If you're doing nothing, you can't really stay outside long enough to let your eyes adjust. But if you're walking about 20 minutes from the base to, to this tower, 
that's a good time to let your eyes adjust and watch the stars. So we would take off our headlamps and we would just just walk in the stars and it really felt like we were in the stars. To give you an idea, it, if it was a moonless day, because, you know, it's actually the day, um, we would actually see our shadow in the light of the Milky Way. So it was, it was amazing. And the, the stars, the shooting stars, um, it was actually during one of those walks to the, uh, the American Tower, as it's called, that I decided to become an astronaut. <laughs> Another one of my projects was routine meteorological observations, which is exactly as it says, basically pred predicting the weather conditions. Again, I was climbing little towers with my paintbrush and removing any snow that had built up, uh, fixing instruments when they broke, and this was kind of, well, do whatever you can because you're not getting any replacements coming in until summertime, which is months away. And launching the weather balloon, uh, which was something that I did every day. Um, it's launched at the same time, exact same time, all around the world. And uh, so that goes into weather predictions everywhere, but also it goes into global climate models again. Sometimes we would write messages on the balloons, and as you can see here, this one was for um, International Women's Day, and so I wrote a balloon, Women in Science, the Sky is No Limit. Sometimes it was quite windy. <laughs> so this was uh, actually the day of my husband's birthday, so there's a happy birthday Liam message on it. Um, but this is... Most days it actually wasn't very windy at Concordia. So the, the high winds happen on the coast because the air builds up in the centre of Antarctica and it goes towards the coast. As it goes towards the coast, it picks up speed. And so you get it, the really high wind speeds on the coast. <laughs> but some days it's like this. Uh, and I nearly got blown away. <laughs> but I survived. <laughs> Another one of my projects was the stratospheric LIDAR, which is basically uh, it's this telescope here. But it's basically a very, very strong laser that points towards some special clouds that happen only during the Antarctic winter. These are called polar stratospheric clouds. Um, and they form sort of from June to September. Um, and they're really interesting because some, some reactions with ozone happen on them. So you can learn a lot about the ozone layer. And also a lot of, about the stratospheric conditions. Another one of my projects was atmospheric aerosol. And so these are basically big air pumps that would suck in the air and uh, they would do a chemi chemical and physical analysis of what was coming in with the air. And that gave us an idea of the kind of contamination that was, uh, that was happening, any kind of pollution that was reaching that point. And if pollution is reaching as far as Concordia, one of the most isolated places in the world, what does that say about the rest of the world? Fortunately, not too much pollution does arrive there. But you can pick up some interesting events. Like if there's a volcano right on the other side of the world, eventually the air current patterns around the world will bring it there to Concordia. So you can see when, when volcanoes happen. And then when I went back to Concordia the second time, I also was in charge of this project called Superdan, which is a little bit different to the other ones I was working on. So this one is actually a big radar. Again, these, there are these radars sort of all around the world. Uh, and this particular radar is, is monitoring space weather. Uh, so when there are solar storms. And um, that also, that interestingly gives information to the International Space Station for when they need to move the station because it might be hit by a solar flare at some point. Then we also had free time. It wasn't all work. <laughs> so someone, when they built Concordia, decided to put some camels there. And it has become a tradition to go for a Sunday walk to the camels. Um, they were standing on top of the ice. Uh, this was a few years ago now, and now, you know, more recently, you basically can't see them anymore. Uh, we had parties. This was an 80s themed party. Uh, we, did, we cooked together. Uh, we had an Italian chef, so um, mostly we didn't have to worry about making food, and we had excellent food provided to us, but sometimes we would work together on a meal. Um, Oh. 
Uh, we also, I also learnt to play the Italian version of billiards, which is actually a lot of fun. Um, played some poker, and also, we actually also had a sauna. So, <laughs> so um, the sauna is outside the base. You have to go outside to get to the sauna. Um, and then, of course, when you get too hot, you go outside in the snow. Um, so I actually experienced a temperature difference of 180 degrees <laughs> from minus 90 outside to plus 90 inside. And then the most beautiful time of the year was the change of season, when the sun came back uh, and we started to get these beautiful sunrises and sunsets. We did a lot of outreach activities. So um, we were in a, you know, a fairly privileged position there uh, to explain the kind of research that's done into climate change. And so we felt it was our responsibility to talk about that to, to children. So we did about 70 or 80 video conferences with, uh, with schools and with public events. And it was actually really fun because it, it gave us that contact with the outside world because here we were, here we were completely isolated, these just 13 people trying to get along well together. Fortunately, we mostly did. Um, but having that little bit of contact with the outside world and gave us an extra bit of motivation to keep going with our work. This was a, a video conference that we did with the International Space Station. And the interesting thing about that is that their internet connection is much better than ours. <laughs> so we had about 512 kilobytes per second. Um, and that was, all, that was for sending all the scientific data and doing anything that we wanted to do. So social media really wasn't a thing for that, for that year. Um, occasionally I would make a post if I would be willing to wait an hour for it to upload. Uh, but it was, it was very slow, which I guess gave me a chance to, to detox a bit. And then there were, there were the European Space Agency experiments. And here we come to talking about white Mars again. So the conditions of isolation, the fact that there's a low oxygen level, and the fact that you're confined with a small international crew, means that it's quite similar to what might be a mission to Mars, hence White Mars. And so the European Space Agency sends a doctor, a research doctor, to do experiments on, on us, on the, the members of the Winter Over crew, to see how our bodies and minds react to those conditions. So they took blood samples from us every, every month, uh, not just blood samples, urine, everything. Um, and so they went into analyses for what astronauts might experience on a long-term space, space mission. And one of the particularly interesting ones that I had the chance to be involved in was a project called SimSkill, um, which involved doing a lot of sort of cognitive exercises, memory games, that sort of thing. But the, but the interesting part was that during the summer season at the beginning, they taught us how to dock this, which is the Soyuz module, onto the International Space Station using a sim simulator. Uh, it should be coming up now. There we go. This is the simulator. And they, they gave us lots of different exercises to do, uh, docking this, this Soyuz, some more difficult than others, some with only instruments, some without instruments, um, some where you could see and some where you couldn't. Um, and so we learnt quite well how to do this during the summer. And then every month or three months, depending on which group we were in, they um, then gave us a test uh, again. And this was to understand how, how, you know, how we understood how our minds changed over time with that isolation. Because, you know, if you're going on a mission to Mars and when you get to Mars, you're going to have to pilot the lander to get down onto the surface of Mars. You've learned how to do that when you're back on Earth. Nine months along, you arrive on Mars and how has your con cognitive function changed over that time? So this was to get an idea of that, to kind of develop the training programs that will need to happen during those long-term missions. So having experienced this, having learned about the European Space Agency, having learned a lot about myself, uh, about the fact that I actually could do a lot of things that I didn't think I could do. So there were a lot of technical skills that I thought I just didn't have. Um, 
you know, there were certain things about electronics and programming that I just hadn't experienced before, and I, I didn't think that I would be able to pick them up, but I had to. I had to, I had to do it, and I had to do it quickly, and in the end, I did, and I really enjoyed it, and apparently I did it well. So uh, I decided that, that, well, that gave me the confidence to then apply to the European Space Agency when they opened applications for astronauts, which had to happen to be the right time because when I was in Antarctica, I heard the first rumors, so this was 2019, I heard the first rumors that they were going to be having a selection process for the first time since 2008. That's a long time in between selections, but it happened to work out well for me because then I was ready in 2021 when the applications did open uh, to make my my own application. So, um, unfortunately, 22,500 other people also applied. I would have liked it if it was just me, but, you know. Uh, so the first stage of the application process was whittling down those 22,500 people to uh, about 13 or 1,400. Uh, so that was based on a CV and a motivation letter and our answers to a questionnaire. Then they did, this is, this is the media kit, but it's not exactly correct because the second uh, or the third, the second phase here was actually a series of psychometric tests. And that means tests on maths and physics and logic and memory. One particularly difficult one was a memory test that they had us do. They would read out numbers, so um, digits between zero and nine. They would just keep reading them out. There might be up to 30 of them, but you don't know how many it's going to be. Uh, and then at some point, they stop. And you have to type in those numbers backwards. <laughs> and the first time you make a mistake, you're gone. So if you make a mistake on you know, the second number, then you only get one point. So when I was training for this, because they, give, they send you the, uh, some training materials about two weeks beforehand, I managed to get up to 17 numbers. I never thought that I would be able to do something like that. Then on the day I got there and they were read out so much more quickly uh, that I definitely didn't get 17 numbers, but obviously I got enough to get through. Uh, then from there, they took about 400 people through to the, the psychological round, which was in Cologne in Germany. Uh, and during that day, they had, we had a bunch of interviews with psychologists, one-on-one -on -one or in a group. Uh, we also did some group exercises and some pair exercises just to see how we would work in a team, to see what kind of leadership and followership capabilities we had. Uh, from there, they took about 100 people through to the medical selection round, which was a whole week of medical tests. Uh, so I always thought that that would be a consolation prize. If I didn't get through because of some medical issue, at least I, I would know that there was something wrong with me and potentially I could, I could fix that. Fortunately, there wasn't. So I got through to the next round, which was a, a panel interview. Uh, there are about 50 of us at this stage. And for me, that was probably the hardest part of the process because it was a, a pretty tough panel interview. Uh, it wasn't just asking operational questions about hypothetical situations that might happen on the International Space Station. Yes, they asked those, but they also asked questions as if they were journalists or as if they were children. Um, and any time that they saw that we were in our comfort zone, they asked a new question to take us, take us out of it. So it was a tough panel interview. Then the final round was uh, an interview with the Director General of the European Space Agency, and that was actually quite a nice interview. It was just a chat. He was just trying to get to know us and um, for us to get to know him. So that was kind of a relief after all the difficult selection process beforehand. Um, and that was actually last year in October, and I was in Australia when I got the call to go back uh, to, to do that interview. So my trip that was supposed to be three weeks was actually only one. So I'm very happy to be back here again this year. And then finally in November, uh, there was the announcement of the, the astronaut class. And I was extremely honored and a little bit surprised uh, to be in that class. So it was, it was when I was riding my bike home from work one day. Um, and I felt my watch vibrating, and I wasn't going to answer the call, but I looked down and I saw that it was a French number. And I thought, hmm, I better answer this one. And it was the Director General calling to invite me to the, the press conference for the announcement of the astronauts. At that point, we didn't know whether we would be 
career astronauts or reserve astronauts. Uh, we were just asked to come to Paris, so we all went to Paris. Uh, we did some media training and we did some interviews and getting to know each other. Uh, and then there was the announcement. And the class is made up of, as I said, career astronauts and reserve astronauts. So uh, ESA has a bit of a different model to NASA. So NASA rec recruits fairly frequently and they can recruit a lot of people and they train all those people, but not all of them get to go to space. ESA, on the other hand, would like to keep up its record of everybody that trains then goes to space. So they have five flights available at the moment and they took five people who have started their, their astronaut training. Uh, unfortunately, I was not a career astronaut, but I was chosen as a member of the reserve. And what that means is that we continue with our normal job. Um, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and we wait for our opportunity. So that could be if for some reason one of the career astronauts can't continue or decides not con to continue with their training. Um, that's probably the least likely option. If the European Space Agency has more flights available and they decide to expand their astronaut corps, which is actually reasonably likely because there are a lot more things on the horizon. And the third way, which is the most likely option, is to have a special project. So actually the first person from this class to fly will be this guy here, Marcus Vant, who's the Swedish reserve astronaut. Um, so he's a member of the reserve and he's going to be the first one to fly because his government has made an agreement with, through the European Space Agency with Axiom Space, which is a commercial provider, uh, to do a trip to the International Space Station. So this is the most likely scenario for how reserves will, will, get, to, will get to fly. And there are some things, some talks happening, so we'll see. Watch this space, as they say. These are the, the missions that, are, that the European Space Agency has and is planning. Um, as we know, there's the International Space Station. Um, the International Space Station has already outlived its lifetime. It was supposed to be 15 years, but that was eight years ago. So um, after 2030, it's going to be deorbited. And then we'll have commercial space stations in orbit. And this is what my new job is about. So I was a material science researcher at the National Research Council of Italy, but I decided that I wanted to get more involved in the space sector. I wanted to be there if something happens. And so I, I spoke with the UK Space Agency and one of the gaps that they identified was somebody to work on their um, exploration commercialization, commercialization strategy. So I do partly reserve astronaut stuff, I do outreach activities trying to inspire the next generation of scientists and space enthusiasts, but I also think about what the future of space exploration looks like when we don't have the ISS anymore. Some of the other missions, you've probably heard of, of Artemis. Artemis 1 has already been around the moon. Artemis 2 is going to go around the moon with astronauts on board, probably next year or the year after. And then after that, humans are going back to the moon, and this time the idea is that we're going to stay. So uh, there's, a, there's a station that's being built to orbit around the moon called Gateway. There are also a lot of satellite communications that are being built uh, that are going to be in orbit around the moon so that when we eventually have a colony or at least a base on the moon itself, we'll be able to navigate and communicate. And at the same time, there's all the Mars activities, and these at the moment are all robotic. Uh, so one in particular is the Rosalind Franklin mission, uh, which is a European rover. And the interesting thing about the Ros Rosalind Franklin mission is that unlike the other rovers that can only sort of dig about seven centimetres under the, the surface of Mars, the Rosalind Franklin mission will be able to dig down five metres. And so that will give us some really, really interesting information about the condition of the planet that hasn't been uh, in any way um, affected by radiation conditions, that kind of thing. It was supposed to launch a couple of years ago, but because of geopolitics, um, it will be launching in a few years when the next uh, uh, window becomes available. The idea is that in the 2040s, we will send humans to Mars. So that's all I have to say of my, of my story, but I'm, uh, I'm here to answer your questions.
are extraordinary. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. Uh, we do have time for questions. Um, pop your hand up and a microphone will come to you, uh, whether you're down here in the theatre or up on the mezzanine level. Um, we certainly have time. Don't be shy. I might start with one. How do you exercise? How did you exercise when you were in Antarctica? Well, there's actually a, a small gym in the base. So to be honest, you get a lot of exercise just going outside. You go outside and you breathe and you're exercising and you walk and you're exercising. Um, so almost everybody uh, will lose weight when they're in Antarctica. I lost something like four or five kilos during, during that time. Um, that's if you're working outside. If you're working inside, you tend to put on weight because you're eating all the good food. Uh, but inside, there's also, there's also a gym. Um, it's a small one, but you, you can get by. And I guess that's a little bit like being on the International Space Station because, the, because astronauts have to um, exercise sort of an hour and a half, two hours per day as part of their schedule. Because over time, they lose muscle mass and lose bone mass basically because there's no gravity, so they're not working against anything. So they need to do these resistive exercises to keep up their bone and muscle density. Just here at the front, Paul. I'm again, thank you, it's a beautiful, amazing talk, very, very inspiring. Um, just wondering with the way that the job works, are you sort of a contracted for a period of years or is it like a until you go to space or is there like kind of a window where if you, then you don't go to space you're not selected within a period of time then that that's kind of missed your shot kind of a thing or yeah there, know, there are no guarantees yeah um but the idea is that we it, as long as we keep up our medical certification and we have to do a medical every year so my one's coming up in october um as long as we keep that up we continue to be part of the reserve um, and, and that's until the next round of selections. Considering that the last round of selections, there were 13 years in between, it could be a very long time. The aim is to have more frequent selections, so probably every six years. Um, but the advantage that we in the reserve have, if we haven't been assigned to a mission by then, which is quite possible, um, as I said, watch this space because there's interesting things happening, um, then we get straight through to that final round, which is the interview with the Director General. So we get that advantage as well. If we're not selected at that point, then that's it. Younger members? Um, How did they figure out how that you just? How did they figure out that they, that you were that you? How did they realize that you that you that you could go that you were able to be able that you could be trained to go to space? Yeah, it was it was it was tough. I mean, especially since they had so many people that applied, um, it was really tough for them to decide who could go. And so that's why they had to do all these different selections based on our, on our cognitive abilities, based on so, so how our mind works, but also um, on how we get along with other people. And I think one of the things that helped me was that I had had this experience in Antarctica. So I've, I had had an experience of working with an, a small isolated team of people. So I had demonstrated that I could do that. Uh, it can't be the only thing because there were there were other people that had been to Concordia and, and didn't even get through the first selection phase. So I think my scientific background also helped there. Um, problem solving, having that kind of um, way of thinking that makes you really a sort of well-rounded, adaptable sort of person. This one just here at the front and then upstairs. Thank you very much for that really fascinating view into how your career has led to you heading into the reserve class of the astronauts. I was wondering if you had any insight into the broader class of astronauts that have gone through ESA and whether or not your 
career trajectory is quite reflected in them or are there multiple ways of getting to space? Yeah, there are really a lot of different ways. So it used to be all pilots. Um, if you wanted to go to space back in the Apollo era, you had to be a test pilot. That has slowly changed um, and they're kind of moving away from that, that pilot. I mean, still need pilots for sure, but most of the, the rockets these days pilot themselves. So they more often look for, for people with a scientific background or engineering or medicine. Um, and so we, we come from all those different disciplines. There are doctors, uh, there are biochemists, astronomers, uh, material scientists like me. Um, so it's quite a mix. What was your favourite part of training? My favourite my favorite part of training, um, well, f so far I've done training for Antarctica and the firefighting training was a lot of fun. Um, but training upcoming, so the UK Space Agency is giving me the opportunity to do some, uh, to make my own pro training program so that I'm ready um, if and when that mission comes. And so I'm going to do some human centrifuge training. I'll probably do some more zero G flights. I'll do some advanced medical training, uh, some flying. So I'm looking forward to all of that. That was, that was extraordinary. Um, I, I would love to ask like a book recommendation if you have a suggestion, but I'll go a bit more specific as in, uh, okay, you're clearly a high achiever, and uh, uh, you, you, you surely have some inner motivation. In the photo in, uh, um, in Antarctica, there was like a, a, like a big bookshelf, and I was kind of wondering if, w w was there any book that you potentially you would have not picked in a normal bookshelf, but you kind of been forced to read because it was the only pick, and then eventually it was actually a good one. If That's that makes a really sense. interesting question. You know, I read a lot about Antarctica while I was in Antarctica, so I became absolutely fascinated by the Shackleton expeditions, for example, to the South Pole, and um, yeah, so I read a lot about Antarctica. Much, Megan. Um, question: If so, it looks like the Americans will, through Artemis, will return to the moon. So, just from someone on the inside and in the know, who do you think will be next? Who, um, the as in which specific astronaut? I, I have no idea. Uh, oh, country. Well, um, on the uh, on Artemis two, there will be a Canadian. Um, so there are a lot of countries that have signed the Artemis Accords, including Australia. Um, probably not an Australian astronaut, unfortunately, but um, on Artemis 4 and 5, there will be Europeans. I don't know which Europeans they will be yet. Hi, yeah, thank you for this inspiring presentation. Um, I just had a question regarding how you mentally prepared to the astronaut selection uh, process and the, for the interviews as well. I guess there was some level of stress going on in there, so I was, yeah, wondering how you did that. Yeah, I think the hardest part was the waiting in between each of the phases, and somehow I ended up as one of the very last people to get through to each stage. They told me afterwards that it was just random. They just did it in a sort of random order, but I, di I didn't know that, so I thought that it was just I wasn't good enough, and so I was being picked at the last moment. Um, so that, that was tough. Um, but in terms of actual preparations, um, I joined a, a Discord server early on in the process of other people that had that were applying, um, and so we had a lot of fun, sort of talking through what we were all putting in our CVs and motivation letters, and what did what did this question on the questionnaire mean, and that sort of thing. And from that Discord server, actually, a, a small group of four of us got together to to make a little space study group. Um, which we called the Space Rangers, and I'm still friends with them today. <laughs> um, and we actually met up in Barcelona one time, and we went to a, we went to an escape room to do some practice. And the escape room people asked us, "Oh, well, how, how do you all know each other?" And we didn't want to say that we were applying to become astronauts, so <laughs> we sort of said, uh, 
we're friends who like to play games online. <laughs> So that was that was a lot of fun. But yeah, we, we got together weekly. We did um, training exercises for what we sort of expected might be coming uh, because there have been some books that have come out of the previous selection process. So they gave us a kind of idea of, of what we might need to train, like those memory exercises and that kind of thing. Um, so definitely working with them. Unfortunately, they didn't get through even the first stage, even though they're amazing people. Um, but they continued to support me the whole way through, and we did practice interviews together, so it was yeah, really helpful. Um, thank you very much. It was a great conference thing. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to know whether you had any role models or female role models in science um, that you look up to, I suppose? Yeah, I, I do often get asked this question, and I should think of somebody. <laughs> um, the thing is that I've always looked up to the people that I know personally, and so I've always looked up to my, my, my family, my friends, my teachers, and so my answer to this question is going to be some random person that you've never heard of. Um, but I guess um, starting out on this journey to become an astronaut, um, I was inspired by Samantha Cristoforetti, who's the Italian astronaut, and she was the only female to be selected in the last round of applications in 2008. So I definitely looked up to her. Hi, Megan. Of all of the future, the, the horizon of space in front of you that you, you see, of all of the different possible journeys that might be available to you, which would you want to do? <laughs> Oh, all of them. Um, <laughs> Apart from that. <laughs> no, I'm, I would love to go to the International Space Station because there's a lot of really interesting research that's happening there. Um, and it's exciting. There's, this stuff is really, really important. And if I can contribute to that, then that would be amazing. But who doesn't dream of going to the moon? <laughs> Change your mic? Yeah, yeah, ask Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I too want to reiterate what everybody was saying. It's just fascinating hearing about your um, professional and personal journey so far. But having spent all that time, you know, on the white Mars, as it were, how did you find adjusting back to reality um, after that? What was your experience of that? Was there anything that particularly – how did it change you at all on your return to not yeah, white that, Mars? Yeah, that, that's a great question because – uh, an experience like that does change you. Um, it literally changes your, D your DNA, apparently, as they found out in some of this easy testing. But, um, I mean, when you first arrive, you are absolutely struck by smells and by noises. So the, um, when I came back the first time on a military plane, I didn't mention that the second time I came by, back by ship, but the first time I came back on that military plane and they opened the cargo door and suddenly I got this rush of smell of, of the freshly cut grass, a smell that I hadn't had for a year. So that was amazing, kind of this assault on the senses. Um, the noise. Uh, I would go into something like a shopping centre and... Just, I almost couldn't stand the amount of noise. It took quite a while to adjust to that. It also took me time to adjust to thinking about sort of small petty things. Because um, I just had what to me was a life-changing experience, but other people hadn't gone through that experience. So they were talking about everyday matters. And it was hard for me to get back into that mind frame of caring about the traffic or this kind of thing. So it was definitely a difficult adaptation. Megan, I'll take the last question. What would you say to young boys and girls who dream of becoming astronauts? Well, I would say follow that dream, um, but follow it by doing something you love because there are so many different ways of becoming an astronaut and they, they are only going to increase uh, as time goes by. If you do what, you're, what you love, that means that you are fulfilled anyway and becoming an astronaut is a bonus. At the same time as pursuing that dream, don't do it single-mindedly because there are interesting opportunities that might come up along the way. 
and these opportunities will really broaden your perspective, give you interesting insights on what you might want to continue to do or might not, might not want to continue to do, but also these perspectives can help you solve problems, solve the world's greatest problems. So I've, I looked out for these opportunities and that's how I got to go to Antarctica and how I, I got to uh, become, become potentially an astronaut. So um, yeah, just got to look out for them and, and grab them when they come. Fantastic, everyone, please put your hands together for Dr. Megan. <laughs> What an absolute treat. Thank you again, Megan. Um, I'd like to close now and thank uh, those who have made this event possible, the University of New South Wales, the Centre of Ideas, Powerhouse, and of course the Italian Embassy in Australia. Um, they have also um, offered uh, the reception snacks and drinks outside, so they're sure to be tasty uh, for anyone who would like to join us um, uh, at the end of, of this evening. Uh, the recording of today's event will be available later this month. Um, on the Academy website. I can think of lots of people who would be interested in hearing about Megan's journey, um, young and less young. I think it's a very, very inspiring journey and we're very privileged to have heard it firsthand. Um, please join us um, in the Jager Room outside for drinks and thank you again for joining us here at the Shine Dome. Thank you.